And Yoel, I understand we didn't get a chance to get that uh, the stuff from FedEx. All right. Okay. I think we're just about I'll talk to you after. Um, yep. Okay. Okay, right, we're live. We're start. okay. We're streaming. Good to go. Yeah. Good to go. Okay. So, uh, like, do something to get your, your, your picture off the screen so I can look at you. Okay, everybody. So, hi, everybody. I'm Danny Grossman. Hey, thanks for joining us for a special Zoom call carried over Facebook and YouTube and brought to you by World Bizrahi. Today's program will be a special edition of a weekly program called One on One with Alan Dershowitz, which was broadcast on IOTV for nearly three years. Uh, we want to give you, our viewers, the opportunity to hear Professor Dershowitz go one on one with his guests and also get a chance to have your questions answered, hopefully, by Professor Dershowitz, uh, one, of a great, one of America's greatest legal minds. He's, a legal expert, he's, a, he's one of the leading experts on criminal and constitutional law civil liberties, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. And hi, Professor Dershowitz, and it's so great to have you back with us. Hey, it's great to be with you. I hope everybody's safe and sound and well and in their homes. Remember that the first Pesach was spent by Jews in quarantine to make sure that the Malachim of us, the angel of death, didn't get us, and we're trying to do the same thing now. So stay home and stay safe. That's right. And as I said, of course, you know, the same word, Shaloyavo Lingof, is the same word used in the original Pesach that you put the blood on the on your doorpost right. was to keep away the magifas, which is hopefully what we're doing today. So without uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. Professor, as you know, we always like to open with special guests. And today our first guest is really one of the great heroes of our time. Dr. Yoel Har-Evin is director of the International Division, Resource Development and the Chief of Staff at the Sheba Medical Hospital, known as oh. Tel Shomer. He served in the Israeli Defense Forces for 28 years, starting out as a frontline combat nurse and rapidly ascending through all the levels of command to reach the position of assistant to the external surgeon general. He retired from the army with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. Dr. Harevin is married to Anat and is the father of four children, Daniel, Nitai, Noya, and Eliana. And I understand two of them are actually currently serving the IDF. So welcome, Professor Harevin. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Danny, and uh, good evening uh, from Israel. And hello, uh, Professor Dershowitz. It's good to see you. Well, thank you. You are a genuine hero, and your efforts have never been more needed than now. Uh, you've always been involved in the work of Pikuach Nefesh, and now more than ever, we need you to continue your great your great work in helping to save lives. So, thank you for being on the show. My pleasure. So, so Yoel, we'll start with you. Uh, what I'd like you to do is to uh, introduce us a little bit, walk us through uh, what you're doing at Tel Shomer, because Tel Shomer, for those people who don't know, uh, for the second year in a row was voted among the top 10, the, the ninth best hospital in the world. And wow. uh, of course, Israel is a startup nation and Israel Biotech is one of the, one of the leading areas where Israel is uh, really a light among the nations. And of course, in this coronavirus uh, world pandemic, uh, you are playing a leading role both in Israel and, uh, and actually through the world. So please give us a little bit of a background what you're doing. And while you're talking, uh, we're going to be running through a couple of videos. You don't have to necessarily talk about the videos as you see them, but they're just examples of some of the innovative things going on at Tel Shomer. So you guys can run the video and yo, the floor is yours. So thank you very much. Uh, our story began uh, 70, almost 72 years ago with the state of Israel when the Sheba Medical Center was established as a military uh, hospital there for the um, front line wounded. Then Ben Gurion uh, decided that uh, what we brought to Tel Shomer. Later on, Sheba became Sheba when Professor Chaim Sheba passed away in 71. And from this point, um, Sheba grows to the one of the um, biggest medical centers uh, around the uh, globe and one of the um, most comprehensive one. Um, our story with the corona is starting actually 50, almost 50 days ago when the government asks Sheba to assemble and allocate some, um, some place for uh, 11 Israelis 
that at the time was supposed to come um, from the uh, cruiser, the Japanese cruiser. Um, they were to, into a long, long trip and they got into the corona situation, uh, been kept by the Japanese for a couple of days and then released to Israel. It turned that they will go directly um, to quarantine areas. So within a few days, we made from them a complete campus that they can live freely. Uh, walk, uh, exercise, um, but still be in quarantine. Uh, you have to understand that at this point, it's um, it's almost uh, new to us how to take care of people that need to be in quarantine, but um, you need to take care of them in a role that you need to uh, expose your staff as less as you can to, um, to the corona situation. Later on, a few of them became positive, a few of them became negative release home. But from this point, um, the snowball started to run very, very fast. And the numbers increased uh, in Israel um, dramatically. We've been asked for uh, from the government to assemble another uh, corona hospital, which right now is running for uh, almost 100 ventilated persons uh, ability. Um, then we came with the idea to uh, dedicate a complete section for um, psychiatric corona patients. Mm. Later on, um, we built a, a, a different section for maternity uh, corona patients. And right now we are in a process to enlarge our uh, ventilating capacity uh, again because of the request of the government uh, to 180 more beds. So um, this is the uh, very quick overlook of uh, our efforts right now. And um, regarding what you just um, um, seeing on the screen uh, from the um, ground zero, I understand that we need to expose our uh, staff uh, as less as we can because keeping the staff uh, resilient and keeping them out of the uh, circle of um, Corona, it's very imminent for us. As much as you can see right now in the state that a lot, and also in, in Italy and Spain, that a lot of um, medical personnel are suffering uh, from corona. A few of them uh, passed away, unfortunately, not in Israel. So we came with all these ideas how to keep our physician and nurses as, as far as we can in from one side, but still be in touch from the other side. So we came with those ideas, like the machine that you mm -hmm. right now see, it, the Taito machine or some other uh, innovation, uh, um, I won't say tricks, but innovation uh, technologies that allow you to measure and control and to be in contact with your patient and you don't need to do it physically so you can do it from the remote right now you can listen to the heartbeats or to the lungs um, this lady is staying uh, home and, and the physician is staying um, a few kilometers mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. where she is and still can can examine her and understand exactly what her uh, condition is I think it's marvelous. Um, I have a particular interest in it because my daughter-in-law is an emergency room doctor at Columbia University Hospital in New York. And uh, that's of course where the highest amount of <clears throat> COVID illnesses are. And we're very concerned that there are insufficient masks and protective equipment for the doctors, the nurses, the technicians, and everybody else and anything that can substitute for human interaction, robots don't catch the virus. And anything that can use robotics or long distance technology uh, saves lives. And of course, Israel has been for years on the forefront of robotics and all kinds of uh, uh, techni techna technicalities and techniques that uh, help save lives. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, not only is my daughter-in-law emergency room doctor, but both of my grandchildren are medical school students and uh, one at Columbia and the other at Stanford. And so they're too uh, right uh, at the center of uh, what's going on and both working hard to try to see if things can be done to, to prevent the spread of this terrible, terrible plague. Yeah, 100% uh, correct, Professor Dashowitz. Uh, I think rule number one in this uh, um, Magifa is to keep your staff um, safe as much as you can and give them the highest level of protection uh, that you could at the time and you can at the time, you know, it's depend on, on resources and, and right. availability. 
Uh, but yeah, so we embedded also robots. Uh, I don't know if I um, I send you some pictures, but we embedded robots that usually on the day to day uh, life are acting in the emergency department and in the ICU department. So our physician, when they are out shift, can can uh, connect right. to the uh, bedside of the patient with the, with a robot and, and listen to his uh, lungs and even look to his eyes. Uh, from remote, so we took that's, the robots that's... and and embedded them directly in the corona pa patient world because it's it's acting the same. Look, it's amazing. Uh, in the middle of March, a month ago, I wrote an op-ed in which I said, "Do not believe two things you're hearing. Do not believe number one that masks don't help at all." At the time, World Health Organization, the CDC, was sending out messages saying masks don't. The second thing is they were saying, don't worry, the virus is not aerosol. It can't carry in the air. I'm not a doctor. I wrote a piece and I said, do not believe that. I said, accept science, but be skeptical of scientists. And I said, I'm going to conduct my life as if masks do help. I'm not going to take masks away from medical providers. I made my own mask. You can make it out of a kippah. Or if you're a woman, you can make it out of a brazier. You can make it out of anything you want. But wear a mask, particularly if you're infected, but even if you're not. And second, act as if you can catch it through the air. Now we're seeing data, it used to be six feet. Now we're seeing 12 feet, as much as 23 feet under certain circumstances. So the point is always to err on the side of safety and to be skeptical when people tell you, oh, it's not as serious. There's a doctor in Israel, I don't remember his name, but he wrote an op-ed the other day, which was just terrible, in which he said, oh, don't worry about the virus. More people are killed in traffic accidents. More people are killed in the war. Why do we have to worry about this? This is just uh, an attempt to shut down the government and be anti-democratic. Be so skeptical of um, anybody, whether they're a doctor, a rabbi, a politician, you have to protect your family and your people, and you got to make cautious decisions and resolve all doubts in favor of safety. Again, um, Professor Dershowitz, you're correct, and I will add uh, one rule to your two rules that you uh, determined. Um, leave your hands in your pockets. Don't, yeah. don't touch nothing. Just leave your hands in your pockets. Uh, but you know, um, this um, coronavirus, um, we learn a lot from day to day. Um, so I think the, the um, clever people, we listen to the others. Mm -hmm. um, those who are not listening and, and ignoring what we and the Italians and Spanish and the, even the, the uh, Chinese, we are in a right. daily, daily uh, talking to our colleagues around the globe because uh, the wisdom is not in this, on the one side of the globe. You need to listen to those who were go through and they have a right, lot of, of experience course. to share, and you don't have you don't need to ignore them. You you can okay. you can you can accept or not. But uh, I think we prefer to accept most of the things that we heard from them, and especially about the maths. Now it's obligatory in Israel. It's obligatory in our me medical uh, facility. My teams are uh, giving uh, visitors uh, the few very few visitors that still are coming. And the patient that are coming, we give them free masks mm -hmm. because yeah, this is the yeah. only only way to protect the the crowd. Look, Dr. Fauci made a very interesting point. He said we will never and should never go back to shaking hands. That shaking hands is over. Shaking hands started five six hundred years ago to show your enemy that you didn't have a weapon. It's an old tradition. Of course, it's nice. But I will never shake another hand again, no matter what happens. It's just an anachronistic and, and, and foolish uh, tradition. Uh, we should adopt now, you know, you just put your thumb up or you wave, do something, but don't shake hands. I have to tell you, the Haredi women have it right. They never shake hands with me. And so uh, I understand now. I wish, I wish the Haredim uh, and nobody should pick on any group. But um, they also have to understand that uh, the traditions of dominion, the traditions of Shiva, the traditions that bind us together and that are so important have to adapt. We conducted our Seder by Zoom. 
um, uh, my grandson in New York, my son in New York, a friend down the road. It was a wonderful, wonderful uh, Seder. You know, we added questions to the four questions and, uh, and we added plagues to the 10 plagues. And uh, I think the reason Judaism has lasted so many thousands of years is its ability to adapt. So I have a trivial pursuit question for all the listeners. What is the most important halachic decision ever rendered by a rabbi in terms of the survival of the Jewish community? And I'll give you a hint. If the rabbi hadn't rendered that judgment, I could not be alive today and I wouldn't be in America today. Uh, all right, I'll give you the answer. The answer is the halachic rule that said you can travel on a boat over Shabbos. Because if you couldn't travel on a boat over Shabbos, no one could have come to America. Um, and no one could have probably gone to Israel. They would have had to go by land uh, from uh, Europe. And that was an adaptive rule and a rule that permitted the wandering Jew to wander from bad places to good places. And that was done by rabbis halachically. And I think that rabbis halachically have mm -hmm. to adapt to uh, the plague that we're now suffering and making sure that we keep our families together, but keep them together safely. Pikuach Nefesh is one of the first mandates of, of Judaism, and it has to come first. But well, Alan, let me, uh, let me just inter interject for one second uh, quickly here. Uh, last Friday, I sent you my good friend, Yaakov Katz, uh, wrote a very nice uh, editorial in which he- It was brilliant. Yeah, he quoted, uh, again, another very dear friend, my colleague from the Air Force, both people don't know, I flew in the U.S. and the Israeli Air Force for 20 years. Um, and Eliezer Shkedi was the commander of the Air Force uh, years ago when he was commander, uh, wanted to integrate the Haredi community into the Israeli Air Force. No, you know, nothing, only so that they would be, uh, become productive members of society, et cetera. And it was a phenomenal success. And the rest of the IDF used that as an example. So hopefully what Yaakov writes is that we can use that same model today rather than uh, throwing stones at each other, but to opening our doors to each other and uh, literally welcoming each other uh, into, the, into the community. Uh, and I think this is maybe part of the silver lining if we can learn to only be smart enough to learn to adopt it. Right, I just have one minor, one minor, uh, comment about what you said. You talked about making them productive members of society. As you know, I work closely with many uh, Haredim, um, uh, both legally and politically, and so many Haredim already contribute enormously oh, to certainly. the community. I have a friend who's developing stem cell uh, research, um, uh, Chaim Lebovitz. He's doing amazing stuff. Uh, uh, my dear friend Dan Gertler is doing amazing stuff. Being a member of the Haredi community does not preclude you from uh, contributing enormously to society. What I think that uh, what Major General Shkedi did, which was so brilliant, was to integrate uh, the Haredi community into the defense of Israel, uh, which is so important. And he did it in such a phenomenally creative way uh, without making them compromise one iota on their religious uh, beliefs, adapting Air Force to them rather than making them adapt to the Air Force. And it turned out to be, as he put it, a win-win for everybody. Well, with that, uh, Yoa, before we say goodbye to you here, uh, and you're, you're welcome to stay, to stay with us, but I know you have a lot of things on your plate, so if you can stay, please do. Uh, but before we go to our next guest, I want to remind everyone who's watching you can uh, ask questions on Facebook. I do not know if we'll have time for it at the end of the program, uh, but that is, uh, but certainly send in whatever questions you have to Professor Dershowitz on Facebook, and we'll try to get at least some of them answered. And uh, then, Yo Yoel, can you elaborate a little bit? Of course, you have the hat of uh, Tel Shomer, which is a, a big enough hat for anybody's head. But one of the things which is interesting and unique to Israel is the way at Tel Shomer there's co-located uh, a national situation room which combines people from the Mossad, from the Ministry of Defense, from Mafat, from the uh, uh, Directorate of R&D, and, uh, and the Health Ministry, et cetera. And that's located at your hospital to try to get the best of the startup nation to coordinate 
uh, national efforts to fight the corona. Can you talk a little bit about that? A little bit, yeah. Uh, I think the um, the roots of uh, those uh, this establishing of of this uh, war room, as we call in Israel is the fact that we are running for uh, almost a year our um, innovation center, what we call the ARC, Accelerate the Redesign and Collaborate uh, on Medicine. And because they were exposed to this uh, a year ago and a few months ago, um, the, the army uh, knew it was uh, and, and want to implant himself into this uh, um, innovation center then the other arms of the um, defense forces came. So um, because they knew that their center is located in the, in the epic center of, of Sheba and it's already uh, vivid and live and, and creating a, a buzz around himself, it was very, very uh, natural for them to ask us to uh, arrange uh, a place for them in Sheba area uh, because most of the agencies is, are, are located uh, there. Um, the Ministry of uh, Health decided um, to move for this uh, crisis to move uh, to work from Sheba. So uh, it was very, very natural uh, to stay with us and, and to, uh, you know, to um, not just uh, we are hosting them. It's not just hosting, it's, uh, it's more collaboration. Uh, with all those uh, elements that are trying to do some good for the state of Israel and, and also some good for the humanity. It's fantastic. What you guys are doing is just unbelievable. You are not only a light unto the nation, you're a model to the world. And may you go from strength to strength. Yeah, Koha. Sure. Koha. Okay. Well, thank you again, Yoel, and you're welcome to stay on. Let's move to our next guest. Our next guest is Dr. Melissa Jane Kronfeld, known to all as MJ. Uh, she completed her PhD at Rutgers University as a division of Global Affairs and has degrees from George Washington University and NYU. In 2014, she launched Passion for a Purpose, a full service social impact and philanthropic development agency with offices in New York and Tel Aviv. Today, MJ is working full-time in a documentary project featuring testimonies from residents of Judea and Samaria, Yudav Shimon, and a book about terrorism featuring testimonies of survivors from around the world. So MJ, it's really a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for having me again, Professor Dershowitz. Lovely to see you again. Nice to see you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. It's not been too long since I've seen you last, but I'm going to jump right in, as is my way. So um, it's not... Um, blind to anyone that there's a global pandemic um, going on in the world. Um, and I'd love for, to start by just having you talk a little bit about how you perceive the shifting geopolitics right now in this Corona age, this COVID age. Um, and and if, you, if you don't mind, you can focus a little bit um, on, on how the United States is being affected both as a global sure. leader um, and also how the Trump administration is being affected because, you know, it seems like pretty smooth sailing up until a few weeks ago. And even I, even I really printed my absentee ballot last week and thought mm -hmm. about maybe maybe what I'm going to do as a, as a proud young Republican in 2020. Um, but so maybe you could talk a little bit about that so we can hear a bit about your, your learned perspective. Well, thank you. You know, I think back a lot on that evening at the hangar uh, at the Tel Aviv um, um, port uh, yeah. the night of the election. There were, I think, 1,500 people there. And um, as you know, when I speak in Israel, people come up to me afterward and hug me and shake my hand yes. and kiss me. <laughs> yes. And that was just before the virus really became obvious to everybody. And I left the next day and it really started to spread. And I myself just went into voluntary quarantine yes. uh, because I was exposed to probably three or 400 people. I, don't ha I haven't heard any evidence, maybe you know, whether any of the people at that gathering tested positive, hopefully not, thankfully not, but it was a wonderful gathering and your role in it was so important. And it was so important to me to be in Israel on election night. I wish elections determine the outcome of elections in Israel and right. we'll see whether they do and whether they do in the United States or not. Look, uh, um, the coronavirus changes everything, every single thing. It changes everything in America, it changes everything in Israel. I never get involved in Israeli politics. I never 
state my preferences for who should be elected. But according to polls I've recently seen, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu's role in very early calling for closures and shutdowns has boosted his poll numbers very considerably. And if there were an election today in Israel, I've seen polls that say his group would get as many as 62 uh, seats. I don't know whether that's true, and I'm not saying anything one way or the other on it, but just to make the point that dynamics change as the result of terrible things happening, the same thing is true in the United States. Everything has changed. Uh, who heard of Governor Cuomo um, outside of New York? until recently. Now a poll showed that more Democrats would want to see Cuomo be the nominee of the Democratic Party rather than Biden. Uh, Biden has to, be, has to have been quiet during this. He's not an elected official. He's in the basement of his home doing some interviews and videos, whereas Cuomo is running New York State and doing a very effective jobs. So anybody who bets on the outcome of the presidential election now violates what the Talmud said. Remember the Talmud said, with the destruction of the temple, prophecy went to children and fools. And um, children can be very smart, but I think it really went to fools. And anybody who tries to predict the outcome of the American election now would be an absolute fool. Nobody can tell. It's really up for grabs. It depends on where we are in early November. We may not be able to go to the polls to vote. I wrote an op-ed just two days ago uh, for The Hill in which I said, we have to start planning now for the election. And I urged the appointment of a blue ribbon commission, nonpartisan, of distinguished people headed by a former Supreme Court justice to recommend ways of voting if the pandemic is still going on whether we can vote by mail, by the internet, by telephone, various other alternative ways of, of voting, because the one thing we can't do is put off an election. The constitution ends the term of the president on January 20th, 2021. We would have no president at that point if there weren't an election. Our constitution doesn't say that if there's no election, the past president continues into office. His term ends at a date designate. So we need to have an election. The election doesn't have to be on a day, on a particular day. In our history, earlier in our history, elections were held over a week-long period because people had to go on their horses and go from uh, their home to their polling station. It could take a long time to do that. We could have the election take place over a week. Right now, Congress has set an election day. By the way, the president has no power to change the election day. Only Congress has that power. But the president does have enormous powers under our constitution during times of emergency. We all hope and pray that it doesn't have to be invoked uh, on election day, but we really, really are. This has never happened before in history. It's never happened during the wars. During the wars, we had elections. During the Civil War, soldiers came home from the battlefield to vote. Uh, president Lincoln sent people home to Indiana to vote in an election. So we've never quite dealt with this before, but we're a resilient nation, as is Israel, and we'll figure it out. Yeah, I should tell our viewers I, I am I'm streaming from Tel Aviv um, right now, even though I have a very very New York accent. Um, so it's it's funny you bring up Cuomo. I think I think um, Rachel Maddow has referred to him as the president of the United States Corona Task Force. So it's very true uh, about him. I'm, I'm I was going to ask you next about your Hill article, um, and you gave us a, a brief overview. And I'm wondering maybe you might explain to our viewers a tiny bit more about the details of your idea um, with with the caveat. Of two questions. So when I read it, and I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a lowly PhD, um, but uh, as, a, as a lawyer, I, I, as, an, as a non-lawyer, I should say, I was curious about the state's rights issues that were involved. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Republican, I'm really a libertarian at heart, as I know you very much so are. Um, so I wonder how that impedes upon states' rights issues. And I'm also wondering, the one thing I came away from reading your article was 
how on earth are we going to get people to pre-agree to this commission in this age of insane partisanship? And I'm guilty of it too. Don't get me wrong. As you know, I was at mm -hmm. on the Ted Cruz campaign and that's where my heart still lies. But um, how, how, is, how is that ever going to work? And uh, Well, I agree. It's a good question. Place. I'm not guilty of it. I am nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. I am a liberal Democrat who voted for Hillary Clinton. In the Florida primary, I voted for Joe Biden, yet I represented President Trump in front of the United States Senate because I believed his constitutional rights were being violated and the Constitution didn't permit his impeachment. So I try to call him as I see them straight down the middle. I, I couldn't serve on such a commission, obviously, because the, many of the Democrats hate me today and uh, wouldn't want me on a commission. But you should be looking for somebody just like me in many ways, somebody who, whether they're a Democrat or a Republican, always calls them straight down the middle. Uh, my goal or the goal of anybody serving on a commission like that would be to maximize voting, to make sure that no voter who wants to vote should be denied the right to vote out of fear that they will catch or spread an illness. So it's very, very important to do that. It'd be very, very hard to get a commission. I mentioned a couple of names, David Souter, who was a justice of the Supreme Court appointed by a Republican, but I think he's highly trusted. You could have also Justice Kennedy, who was appointed by a Republican, but trusted, I think he vote. He was the swing vote in many, many cases. You could have university presidents like Stephen Trachtenberg of George Washington University or Derek Bach, the former president of Harvard, could do that. Uh, by the way, from now on, I have to call you doctor. I no, 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 no. Uh, I was... Uh, uh, not raising up the level of what you deserve to be called doctor. So from now on, you're a doctor. I have a doctorate too, but I didn't work for mine. I just gave a speech um, mm -hmm. at, at various universities and they gave me honorary doctors. My wife is a real doctor, but I'm a fake doctor. <laughs> well, I should say my mother always says to me, you're not a real doctor. I don't understand why people call you doctor. It's not like you could save somebody's life. But I say, yes, mom, but if there's an international crisis, I may be able to resolve it. So that's why I guess. Yes, right. That. You can save many people's <laughs> lives. You, you earn your doctorate the hard way and you deserve to be called doctor. So, um, but, but Alan, uh, and, Alan and MJ, before yeah. I go too far in this, you know, yeah. you have her both being called doctor and MJ. <laughs> We're getting too, too, too deep into basketball for me just now. But uh, MJ, if you will take time out to use the, yeah. the basketball thing for right now. And sure. we're going to try to get back to it a little bit because we have a little surprise oh. for those people, uh, most of our viewers who don't know, uh, the, the event that uh, MJ was talking about and Alan was talking about was an event. Every time Alan comes to Israel, we try to have something public for him. And I try to do something for the young people. So there's a wonderful young person named uh, Jay Schultz who has some 20, 30,000 people on his email list. He has a thing called Tel Aviv Internationals where he, the whole purpose of it is to get young English speaking people in Tel Aviv to uh, do various uh, good deeds and provide them. They do a thing like adopt a safta and they do wonderful things. And one of the things they did was uh, they provide cultural events for English speakers. And we had Alan uh, speaking in front of 1500 young people on the night of the election, which was amazing. And talking about uh, you know everything from uh, you know, from the impeachment hearings, which people have kind of forgotten about, all the way through the uh, the Iranian and the, uh, the threat and uh, anti-Semitism. So that's what you were referring to, and we're going to try to recreate one of the elements we had, and we're going to we're going to stop for that one second because I want to get to our next guest right now, uh, who's also going to talk about another event that happened here, Alan, during your recent trip, your recent vi uh, visit to Israel. So our next guest is Ilana Mizel the deputy director of the Tikva Fund in Israel, and she's chairwoman of the forum. She obtained her law degree at Georgetown. The, the Israel Law and Liberty Forum is a new initiative aimed at promoting conservative and classical liberal ideas about the law, democracy, and the role of the judiciary in society in Israel. And the forum works to promote principles, including separation of powers, judicial restraint, and individual liberty and the forum is a project of the Tikva Fund, inspired and assisted by the Federalist Society. So working with the Tel Aviv Law School, uh, the forum was privileged to host you, Professor Dershowitz, in a conversation uh, between you and Professor Avi Bell last month at Tel Aviv University, included people like uh, Professor Daniel Friedman, the former 
uh, Minister of Justice in Israel. And that event took place just one day after Israel's third national elections in a year. So Ilana, thank you very much for joining us. And, but before you even speak, because I want what you speak, I don't want to interrupt you. Uh, I want to roll just 20 seconds of video to give people a feel for what this event was like at Tel Aviv University. So guys, if you'll run that. When I made my, my speech in front of the Senate about the Israeli system, and I think there are striking parallels between the indictments against uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and the impeachment of President uh, Trump. Abuse of power is not a legal criteria. It's a political cliche. And abuse of trust is not a constitutional criteria for criminalization. It is a weaponized cliche, and the Israeli Knesset should abolish that as a criteria for crime. Okay, so Ilana, the floor is yours. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me, and hello again, Professor Dershowitz. It's an honor Hi, to see you. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so last month, it really was a, a fantastic event, and I was hoping that we could recap part of what we did uh, tonight, as well as get your updated thoughts. A lot has happened in the past 10 years to a month. Um, so it's also, you know, kind of an honor to try and share some of the Israeli judicial story through American eyes to a much broader audience. The clip that we just saw centered on a major theme of the event, which was the application of criminal law in political proceedings in the U.S. and Israel. And you're one of the only people, as far as I know, that argued both against the impeachment proceedings against President Trump, as well as against charges brought against Prime Minister Netanyahu. So right. what are some of the parallels you mentioned and uh, how did they affect your argument? Well, you know, first of all, I so much support what you folks are doing in your organization. Uh, I'm writing a book now, I'm almost done. Tentative title is why I left the left but couldn't join the right. Another tentative title is the case for liberalism in an age of extremism. What I try to argue is that genuine liberals and classic conservatives share more in common than either of us do with the extremes of our wing. Um, I despise the extreme left of the Democratic Party, the squad, the Sanderistas, and I equally despise the extreme right of the Republican Party, the Pat Buchanan's, the uh, ext extremists on the religious side. And I think that centrist, liberal centrist conservatives ought to get together to promote separation of powers, limited judiciary, freedom of speech, equality, lack of identity politics, and most important, not weaponizing the criminal justice system against your political enemies. That's what both the United States and Israel are falling into. The idea that you can prosecute a prime minister for the quid pro quo of seeking positive media coverage or avoiding negative media coverage poses such an incredible danger to freedom of speech, to political freedom, and to values of a democracy. The same thing is true in America, charging a president with abuse of power. 40 of our American presidents have been charged with abuse of power. Every president is thought by his political enemies to have abused their power. So we need to get back to the day when the criminal justice system, the impeachment powers are used in a narrow way as intended by the framers, in our case, the framers of the Constitution in Israel, the framers of the Declaration of Independence, the framers of the basic laws, the framers of what Israel is all about in terms of democracy. So Kol Kavod continue to do this, but work together with genuine liberals. We're an endangered species. Uh, you may be talking to one of the few left in America, uh, a, a genuine liberal who doesn't take sides on partisan political issues. And I think there are some in Israel as well, and, and we should work together. By the way, speaking of my books, I wanted to mention uh, that because of the coronavirus, I made my newest book available free to anybody who's at home uh, on Kindle. It's called Guilt by Accusation, The Challenge of Proving Innocence in the Age of Me Too, and you get it for free. And it's a short book, 150 pages, and it's a good shut-in book. It won't make you happy, it'll make you nervous and upset, but that's the function of, uh, of interesting books. So. So um, uh, let's continue to work together. And, and I think we have a lot in common here. I completely agree. And we will take any chance that we can to work with you. 
I'll also say that I'd be happy to read your book even if I wasn't in quarantine. Um, uh -huh. in, ter <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, the genuine liberals, though, we have one at the very least in Israel that I, I can think of, the chairman of our advisory board, uh, Minister Friedman, a former minister of justice, Daniel Friedman, is perhaps one of Israel's you know, best known uh, legal authorities. And he's been incredibly critical of the uh, judiciary. And he explained at our event that Israel, in his view, is in constitutional crisis. And he was referring specifically to a very, very big imbalance uh, in Israeli politics caused by legal activism in the courts. So you actually emphasized at the event that your position had moved closer to his over the years. And I was wondering if you could give a little background on that and explain why. Okay, uh, first of all, I have enormous respect for Dean Fr Friedman, Justice Minister Friedman. Uh, he's one of the great Israelis of all time. We disagree. Um, I thought that he went too far in attacking uh, the Barak court and in attacking the Banish court. Um, and I thought that, um, um, and we disagree. I, 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 I had some criticisms of some of the opinions of the court, but I thought he had gone too far, but now, I really have come to appreciate the structural and institutional arguments he's making. He doesn't make them in an ad hominem way. He's not attacking particular judges or particular justices or particular decisions as much as he is focusing on the institutional issues. They're coming to a head as we speak now because as we know, one of the issues separating out the blue and white from Lee Kud is the manner by which judges are selected. My own hope is that we have to keep that process depoliticized, make sure it doesn't ever turn into what happened in the United States now, where we have Republican justices and Democratic justices, notwithstanding the fact that our Chief Justice denies that. Just look at Bush versus Gore. Just look at the most recent opinion that let the election go forward in Wisconsin without allowing it to go over a couple of days. It was a five to four decision with all the Republican justices voting one way and all the democratic justices voting the other way. I don't wish that ever on Israel. Israel, the judiciary has for many years been the jewel of the country and it shouldn't go too far. It should maintain its role as part of the system of democracy and checks and balances, but has to understand that Israel is a parliamentary democracy and the parliament is supreme. It's not like the United States. The United States has three co-equal branches of government three co-equal branches in the constitution. Israel is a parliamentary democracy where the parliament ultimately makes decisions for better or worse. And democracy doesn't always guarantee you good results. It's a process, not an outcome. So I've come to appreciate more uh, the Dean's point of view. We continue to disagree over particular applications because although he's a liberal and I'm a liberal, I think I'm slightly more to the left liberally than he is, although we could have him on and we can have a debate, maybe that's not the case. But you know, ha have you ever seen two Jews agree about anything? Two Jews, three opinions, you know, one I Jew, one see one Jew agree with himself. synagogues. So, you know, when Winston Churchill came to Palestine for the first time, he was amazed to see this little settlement of Jews with multiple newspapers. Um, but of course, that's what Jews do and that's what Israelis do. Um, I want to, maybe I put uh, the card before the horse a little bit. I just want to, for people that don't know, explain that some of the things that uh, Professor Friedman was referring to uh, were the fact that Israeli judges are just not constrained by many uh, prudential considerations that American judges take into account. So for instance, they think that pretty much any case uh, is something that should be heard by the court or can be heard by the court. Um, and there's no rules about standing, meaning anybody could theoretically bring a case to the Supreme Court, even on things that don't personally affect them. Um, they occasionally rule against the plain text, meaning of the law, and so on. There's a, so from an American perspective, at least, um, whatever your specific position on, on the court, it's a, it's a very different regime than we're used to. Um, of course, no, you're, you're right. But of course, in America, the left is trying to eliminate standing requirements. They're absolutely trying to do that. And they are succeeding to some degree as far as the plain meaning of the Constitution. Could you ever get a plainer meaning than the criteria for impeachment? The criteria for impeachment are treason, bribery, mm -hmm. or other high crimes and misdemeanors. 
And I looked at that. I looked at the simple shot um, without even getting to drash or remez or sowed or anything, just the simple meaning of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Obviously, it requires criminal type behavior. Treason is criminal, bribery is criminal, high crimes are criminal, misdemeanors are criminal. And yet I was called bonkers, a fool, uh, every name in the book, because I said that before you can impeach a president, you have to show criminal type behavior. People just mocked it. If Hillary Clinton had been impeached and I made exactly the same argument, the same people would have praised me. But the academy in America has become so biased and so oriented toward the Democratic Party and away from the Republican Party, particularly away from President Trump, that mm -hmm. uh, you can't even make a reasoned argument without being called a fool by your colleagues. And I would say 90 percent, maybe more of academics disagreed with me in my analysis of the Constitution. The only problem is they're all wrong and I'm right. And uh, the text of the Constitution proves it. The debate among the framers proves it. The 19th century interpretation proves it. The weight of constitutional authority in the 19th century. The words didn't change. Only the politics have changed. And so, uh, of course, I have another book about that. I have a book called Defending the Constitution in which I lay out my arguments for why these were not constitutionally appropriate criteria. But look, I wish I were in Israel more because I would love to engage with your group more on these issues. They're always matters of degree and always require nuance and calibration. And that's what I think we're lacking in today's dialogue. Today, you pick sides. You pick a team, the Red Sox or the Yankees, Maccabee, Tel Aviv, you know, you got to pick a team. And once you pick a team, you're expected to be totally loyal to the team. I'm a liberal Democrat, but I am not loyal to the Democratic Party. I call it as I see it, and I'll continue to do that. I think it, you know, it's contributed to making you uh, uh, just a worldwide authority on the areas in which you're expert. And, uh, and a worldwide subject of criticism. But also okay. universally respected in certain ways, I would say. <laughs> not universal. Um, I, yeah. I don't know when Danny's going to jump back in, but I do have a couple of more questions. Sure, um, please, go ahead. Well, ac actually, uh, Ilana, you actually cued me to come back in, so uh, you never no. say that. You, this is what they call in the Army a kit bag question. You never, you never ask, should we bring the whole kit bag? Then, of course, the sergeant's going to say, of course you should bring the whole kit bag. So <laughs> we'll just, I'm just going to take a time out, because I also took a time out from MJ. And mm -hmm. taking a time, time out from MJ, taking time out to you. And, and the last soundbite, Alan was mentioning uh, teams. And, you know, without, and by the way, if you've noticed now, one thing which I've done virtually for all of the events that uh, we do here with you is I try very hard to maintain um, different voices, uh, both in age and in gender on all of our uh, programs, because it's, it's extremely important to show different uh, perspectives uh, on that. So- Danny, uh, I really appreciate that you include young people like me on these panels, because I think that youth is sometimes uh, ignored. So thanks for including a youngster like me and um, among the older folks that you have as well. Thanks. Well, well for those people, Alan, who don't know, I always define uh, Alan Dershowitz, you have the age of eight 10 year olds. So uh -huh. that, that, that's, uh, you, have, you have the energy I'm telling you, I got uh, six grandchildren. None of them have your energy. None of them. It's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, but with that, um, by the guys, that's also my cue to let our, our uh, uh, well, we're going to let our mystery guest in in a second, but I'm going to preface this just like on what's my line, Alan. Uh, we have a mystery guest for you, a friend of yours okay. for many years. Okay. And uh, I'll guess. Okay. Let me guess. Oh, you're going to guess. Oh, this is terrible. You think I'll guess, guess right? It. You're gonna okay, get. Um, you're right. Let me see. If I if I dribble to the answer, will I get there? Do you think? All right, all right. It's not it's not Ralphie Lipschitz, okay? But now you got to explain. It's not it Ralph Lipschitz. Loren. It's not Ralph Loren. But you know who it isn't? Also, it isn't Dr. Fauci. You know, Dr. Fauci played basketball for uh, I think Xavier High School in Brooklyn when I was playing basketball for Yeshiva University High School in Brooklyn. And we often played Catholic school teams, but I don't remember ever playing Dr. Fauci. Fauci was apparently a real star basketball player. I got mostly splinters on the bench, but uh, 
Um, but uh, I think I know who your next guest is. Well, uh, you know how much I love Where you defined as Alan Dershowitz? Ooh, where, where does that come from, Alan? Oh yeah, it's because I used to have a lot of zeros at the end of my name uh, okay. for the score. Dershowitz, right? Dershowitz zero point zero field goals, zero foul shots, um, zero rebounds. So that was my my nickname, Dershowitz. Well, no, but uh, but seriously speaking, by the way, you're you're there's so many people who've been your students. Again, we mentioned uh, earlier earlier uh, Ted Cruz and uh, Michelle Obama are both your students, and of course uh, and Stephanie Power was one of the former ambassador to the United Nations was one of her students. And and an event we put together, she actually wrote that she quoted Earl Warren, uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice who once wrote that uh, when he opens up the New York Times, he goes first to the sports page and then to the front page. Because he said, if you want to read about uh, man's failings, uh, then you turn to the front page. If you want to read about his, his dreams and his overcoming adversity, then you go to the sports page. Well, I so, start with the obituary. I start with the obituaries. If I'm not in it, then I go to the sports pages. Right? <laughs> So with that saying, let's, let's uh, and by the way, the guy who is not here is also a very uh, a big baseball fan. Uh, but for this portion of the program, I put on the, uh, the Israel Team Israel national shirt. For those people who don't know, I'm also helping to mentor that. And of course, we, we uh, were successful not only in reaching the Olympics, but the day after you left, Alan, uh, Ian Kinsler, a uh, four-time All-Star, and um, a, according to Boston Alter, Red Sox, absolutely. Well, his his great years were actually with the Texas Rangers and later with Detroit, uh, where he played for played for Brad Ausmus, another two, uh, another year. But uh, so Ian Kinsler made Aliyah, and hopefully we will have a an excellent chance at the Olympics now in uh, 2021. So without further ado, let me go to. Uh, a video clip which will start describing uh, a situation which was just like in Israel last week on Pesach when no one was seen outside their homes. So uh, let's run that videotape and I think that'll pretty much give it away. There was no reason to expect Maccabi could beat Red Army Moscow. The streets were empty. You couldn't get a taxi. Nothing moved. Nothing moved. The excitement was just too much. I wanted more. There are some things that are more important than sport. It is easily one of the greatest sporting accomplishments ever. All that excitement, all that pride just came out of my heart. Wow, wow. So, wow. With, with that being said, we've had MJ tonight, but now we're going to go to Israel's MJ. Uh, tell him you're with us. Or you guys got to turn him on or... I'm here. Do you hear me, Danny? There you go. Hey, Tal. You made my Hi, day. Hi, Alan. Hey, How are it's you? great to see you. Yeah, you're in quarantine. We've been in, we've been in uh, voluntary quarantine for since I got back from the NBA All-Star Weekend. Yeah. A few yeah, weeks yeah. after, about a month already. Right. My son was at that weekend. My son uh, runs the Women's National Basketball Association and is Deputy General Counsel of the NBA, so he's very much involved. He's been in the NBA for 25 years. You know that a, a bar mitzvah is when a Jewish boy learns that his chances of owning an NBA team are slightly better than playing on one. Of course, you were drafted to play on one and you selected Israel rather than the NBA. Well, it's a, it's a long story, but- um, I read it, it in your book. Expected. It wasn't my dream when I was growing up in Trenton, New Jersey, or going to the University of Illinois and, you know, luckily I got invited to the Maccabea Games, 1965, the seventh Maccabea with the U.S. team. And it just changed all my goals and perspectives that when they came to me and they said, look, Tal, 
our team never got past the first round of the European Championship. You can go back, uh, play at that time the Baltimore Bullets. It's the Washington Wizards, as you know, of today. And be one of many players. But here, you can change a whole country. And this appealed to me. It appealed to me because the fellow that was asking me that was a Holocaust survivor. And it was uh, July, August. And all I saw on his arms, the numbers on his arms. And it reminded me when I was a youth growing up in Trenton, all the movies on the TV or in the movie theaters were about World War II and what the Nazis yeah, did to the course, Jewish community of course, of course. and everything that was happening. And here somebody's asking me if I can do something. At that time in the States, there was nothing I could do as a youth and going to high school and then to college. And so I said, taking a year out of my life, it's not going to be a big deal, especially, you know, 1965, the NBA, the salaries that, uh, let's say, like Rick Barry, Billy Cunningham, Bill Bradley, we all signed for about twelve and a half thousand dollars a year. <laughs> I remember because I was a good friend of Red Auerbach and he used to nickel and dime every player. He wouldn't allow agents to negotiate. He would come in the office. He'd say, it's 12 grand. Take it or leave it. That's it. <laughs> but by the way, everybody ought to read Tal's book. I look at it all the time. It's a great book. From Aliyup to Aliyah. Uh, it's, uh, it's a terrific. It tells the whole story. And you're an inspiration. You inspire the whole country. And you continue to inspire. I went with you to a basketball game a couple of years ago. It was like Elvis Presley going to Graceland. It was like the Beatles going to Liverpool. It was absolutely <laughs> amazing. People came to you, uh, just amazing. And they, and you know, it's been a long time. Interestingly enough, you know, I, 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 I spent some time with Sandy Koufax a few years ago in Boston and people in Boston didn't recognize him, even though he was a great hero, Sandy Koufax. Uh, but people didn't recognize him. You, they recognized no matter how many years later, you're still the guy who put Israel on the map. And so thank you so much. Well, thank you. You know what I remember about the game that we went to in Israel? You know, like we went together at the, when I was in Boston to the Boston Celtics game. So that's right. When we came yeah. to Israel in that game, I remember Danny Grossman, you asked him if he can go out and get earplugs for you earplugs. because the crowd was so loud, you know, this unbelievable. Israel. It was a small a stadium. Game. Maybe maybe it was in Herzliya or somewhere. I don't remember. Yeah, Herzliya. Herzliya yeah. game. And it was and there were drums banging and people <laughs> screaming. Back, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I you know I that's the spirit of Israel, my... Alan. The, the games yeah, are that's exciting. great. Hey, look, I loved it. I loved it. And Alan you know, and... like when you look at our record, you know, like from the time when they asked me to come for a year to Israel. And that year I saw what was, bas what was basketball doing for the country, the spirit, and the fact that we're able to win uh, in countries in East Europe at that time, at that time behind the Iron Curtain, where Jews yeah. were suffering from a lot of anti-Semitism. And then when we played in West Europe, in Belgium, in France, in Germany, what it did, that spirit that we can win against those teams in those countries, mm -hmm. it just picked up all the Jewish communities I wouldn't say that there today it's uh, maybe even more anti-Semitism than it was then, but still what they yep. were suffering. So I yeah. saw the meaning, what basketball can do. And that's what changed my old thinking about returning and playing in the NBA or what I saw, what was happening to a country because a kid from Trenton, New Jersey decided to make Aliyah to Israel. You did the right thing. You did the right thing. It was Bashert. And I think what you did had an enormous impact. Look, you would have been a great NBA player. You would have helped a lot to promote the Jewish image in the United States as well. But what you did in Israel is just unmatched in, in history. So we owe you a tremendous debt of gratitude. And I think you've had a good life in Israel. You have a family and everything. And uh, you're so exactly. highly respected. Uh, you, know, you know what our family did for Passover this year? We were all on Zoom, you know. Yeah, me too. <laughs> because the grandchildren and the children weren't allowed. You're not, in fact, up to today, they're not allowed to visit their grandparents. And so with us. we we all connected and we did the Passover Seder on Zoom. It was amazing. I agree with you. 
I was, wish the Orthodox rabbis were a little bit more permissive and allowed Zoom. I have Orthodox friends who turn Zoom on, Erev Pesach, and because in the United States it's three days, kept Zoom on for three days from Wednesday night until Motzei Shabbat, kept the Zoom on and did the Zoom. Uh, others, of course, just didn't do it. But uh, I think... Uh, I think God invented Zoom for just such an event and for this amazing. event today. Yeah. Amazing. When you read Manish Tana, Laila Azeh, you know, what yeah. is the difference of this night from all other nights? The children yeah. exactly knew what was different from what that night. What the difference was. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. it's interesting because we couldn't, we're on Martha's Vineyard and we're isolated and we could not get uh, Marar. And so I quoted uh, Sharansky when he was in the Gulag where they couldn't get Marar. He said, Moror is a symbol of suffering. We don't need Moror in the Gulag. We have the actual suffering. And we said the same thing at our Seder. Mm -hmm. We can't get the Moror. Uh, the best I could do was, was mustard that had a little horseradish in it. But we decided not to do that. We decided instead to say that because the world is suffering so much from the coronavirus, that that's the Moror that we don't need to have the piece of on the Seder plate. So we had a very meaningful Seder. Well, Alan, Alan, I'm sure you know that this year, you know, with the Seder taking place and so many different countries were hard hit getting things that Israel actually sent uh, supplies of uh, Seder supplies. I know, I know what's coming. I, I know you know what's coming. So, of course, you know, El Al sent a special uh, aircraft 787 Dreamliner filled with matzahs. And but unfortunately, they forgot to unload the, the horseradish, and it, and it came back in the tarmac in Tel Aviv, and, uh, you know, the head of El Al was furious with the guys for leaving it there, and they said, why did you leave it on the airplane, not unload it, and not unload it, and they said, well, didn't you hear the crane in Spain stays mainly on the plane? Ooh. Yeah, but in the United sorry, States, sorry. Uh, the, sorry, the sorry. crane from Spokane, or from Maine, was delivered by train. So, so let, let me... You know, uh, in April, Danny... In April, it's usually the finals of the European Championship, and you're talking about matzahs being loaded on planes. So uh, those that don't know, our team, Maccabi Tel Aviv, since then has won six times the European Basketball Championship, one international championship. We've been playing NBA teams for the last 20 years. And for Israel's 60th uh, birthday, I was invited to the James Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame that our team, Maccabi Tel Aviv, was the first team outside of the United States that was honored and granted an exhibition for a team that can pull. Like in Milano in the 2014 championship, we had over 10,000 Israelis and Jews from Europe that came to support our team. And it's amazing. Now, because it's in April, uh, from Far Chabad, they had to, they loaded the planes with matzah so that we would all have matzah and have a Passover uh, meal at the time of the European Championship for all the players. It was amazing. That's yeah. fantastic. That's great. Well, yeah. Well, what, I, what I did want to mention though, worthwhile, could, uh, could, to bring it back uh, seriously, is that, um, you know, what you have done for Israel uh, it's absolutely amazing, and you continue to do it both as uh, in your official capacity as ambassador of goodwill for the state of Israel, that you go around uh, using sports to build bridges with other countries, and you continue to do this uh, on your own time on behalf of the state of Israel, uh, making, of course, with the, with the NBA players who come here, etc., uh, but on a much wider scale than that, and talking about inspiring people, uh, for those people who don't know, I've actually helped mentor the Israeli uh, baseball uh, team. Great. Mostly made up of Americans who come over on Aliyah. We have some native Israelis, but uh, the, the the star players like Ian Kinsler, I mentioned, or Ryan LaVarnway, who was the MVP of the 2017 uh, Israel uh, team, which won or came in sixth place in the World Baseball Classic, uh, or other uh, John Moscott and other uh, pitchers who pitched in the uh, MLB. Uh, tell what you have done, again, on your own time, is you have explained to these guys when they do come to Israel, you've, you've taken your own time and explained to them what motivated you. And you putting Israel on the map in 1977 is exactly uh, what we hope to repeat next year. And you 
you remain an inspiration to everybody in every way, uh, of, uh, Jews everywhere. So, Yosha uh, Koach, and have a Chag Sameach. So with that, I'll let you go, Tal. You can stay on, of course, but I want to bring back MJ, if I could, if you guys can get her back. Hi, Tal. So, Hi. Uh, MJ, we have you. So this also a surprise. At that, e at that event we had, Al, one of the fun moments we had was we MJ had came up with a lightning round of not even questions, just one or two word associations. All and, right. And so if you're ready, uh, go Always for it. Ready. All right, Professor Dershowitz, thank you again for um, for participating in this. So this lightning round, last lightning round was a bit a bit more Jewish and Israel centric. This lightning round is um, the COVID edition, as I'm calling it. So we okay. want to learn a bit more about what Professor Dershowitz is doing to keep socially safe and isolated. So um, and remember, these are just really quick responses, and I've got about sure. ten of them for you. So worst part about being in self isolation. The fact that I can't hug my grandchildren and be with them uh, personally over the stator. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, best part about being in self-isolation? Uh, being with my wife 24-7, uh, not being uh, interrupted, uh, being able to write a lot and walk a lot. I walk every day. I try to walk at least five miles. I don't see a single person, which is very nice. And uh, I'm with my daughter and her fiance as well. And we're in isolation together and they're doing the cooking and I'm doing the eating. I should ask when we were with you last, you had the ring and your daughter and her fiance were stuck elsewhere. The ring, the fiance and the daughter were eventually reunited, I'm assuming. They're all reunited. My daughter is wearing her beautiful, beautiful ring that her uh, wonderful fiance gave her and they both are into cooking. So you could not believe the matzo ball soup that we had for the Seder and we didn't have matzo mail. They had to take a matzo and break it up into little pieces. And they made the most fantastic matzo balls and most terrific matzo ball soup. And uh, I told them, do they have to wait for the next Pesach to get it again? So I'm campaigning for uh, uh, another edition of the Ella Dershowitz, David Stern matzo ball soup. Carolyn Cohn, she's my wife. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, based on your answer then, I want to skip ahead to a question I had later on. What advice do you have for making your marriage work when you're stuck at home with your wife all day? Well, understand her needs. That's the most important thing. Just make sure you understand that you're not the only one going through um, isolation. Uh, you know, there are going to be little disagreements, obviously and be very, very uh, tolerant. You know, it's interesting. I'm a really tough guy outside of my house when it comes to the court of law, when it comes to the court of public opinion. But in my home, I'm a total pushover. I'm never right. I always agree. Uh, I never say no. And uh, it's led to, um, you know, 30, 35 years of, of, of a great, great, uh, happy marriage. And uh, I hope another 35 years would be very nice. Well, maybe we could end the Jewish intermarriage crisis if we could clone you. So my mm. next question- And my, and my is, wife, and my wife. <laughs> and your wife, and your wife. Um, so my next question is, what Netflix series have you been binge watching? Well, we have binge watched um, <laughs> several Israeli um, uh, programs, um, 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 Prisoners of War. Um, okay. We've also binge watched the variation of that, Homeland. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've, uh, I don't watch cable television. I cannot stand watching the news because there's no such thing as the news. I start one of the chapters in my new book with the sentence, Walter Cronkite couldn't get a job on television today. You cannot get an objective, fair assessment of the news today in, in the United States from any one source. Yeah. Um, so what favorite movie have you watched? What's your favorite movie so far that you've watched for the first time? What new movie is your new favorite movie? Well, we just watched a new Israeli movie and I'm um, forgetting the name now, but it was, oh, it's something about, it was about a woman Mossad um, person who leaves the Mossad um, and uh, she falls in love with 
the Iranian um, uh, ha person that she's supposed to be um, spying on, but I don't remember the name of it, but it was very intriguing. It was a, like an hour and a half, two hour movie. We enjoyed it very much. Israelis have done a phenomenal job in the series and, and movies. I remember when Israeli movies were really a joke, um, but <laughs> in the last uh, 20, 25 years, um, of course, one of my former students um, um, did a movie, uh, uh, Amasaz's uh, 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 movie, uh, and um, um, her movie was, was quite successful. So um, she's an American, but she made a movie in Israel and in Hebrew, Natalie Portman. I didn't know her when she was my student as Natalie Portman. I knew her by her family name, Natalie Hirschlag, and I didn't know she was an actor or famous. She was just a very, very good student in my seminar on neuropsychology and the law. Well, if we're talking about Israeli movies, we should obviously do a plug for Danny Menken and Tao and Alsi for both their films on the map and Alsi, which was released last year and is a really fantastic film. So what, what favorite movie have you rewatched? What, what, what movie have you found yourself rewatching you're coming back to? Because I know the world is watching Pandemic apparently right now. I am not, but I'm wondering what you're rewatching. I don't like to watch movies like that. I like to watch, I like to watch old movies. Uh, movies like Judgment at Nuremberg. I like to watch movies like uh, Inherit the Wind or, uh, you know, even movies uh, uh, that old musicals. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a sap for old movies. My daughter, who's a, a movie actress, an actor, uh, mostly stage, uh, mostly off-Broadway stage, uh, she finds it hard to watch old movies. They're too slow for her. They're too slow paced. They're not um, they're black and white. Um, um, recently, I watched, I rewatched parts of Exodus. That really, that movie okay. really holds yeah. up, and it's amazing. It tells one thing that's interesting. The man who wrote the screenplay, people don't realize that, was Dalton that's Trumbo, who was um, uh, on the blacklist. He was a communist, and those were the days when the communists supported Israel. Today, hard to imagine a man like Dalton Trumbo, a man of the hard left writing uh, such a pro-Israel uh, screenplay as, um, as Exodus, but it shows you how quickly things have changed and how the left has moved so harshly against Israel. Today, I think Dalton Trumbo or somebody like him would be writing a movie called Nakba, not Exodus, and telling the story of the Palestinians. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was saying Jabotinsky, um, Jabotinsky, so in Samson has been, has been my favorite with Casablanca, uh, which was my dad. So what's the favorite book that you read? Well, do you know, so you know that uh, yeah. talking about baseball and Casablanca, that yeah. uh, the screenplay for Casablanca was written by the uncle of the former Boston Red Sox general manager, Theo Epstein, who is now the general manager of the Chicago Cubs. So this connection between Casablanca and Major League Baseball. Yeah, no, I'd say it was my father's favorite movie and his Yarzite is coming up. So it's something that I have found myself finally understanding in a real way. Um, so while that. you've been in, in isolation, what, what's the best book you've read so far? I haven't read any books. I've been writing them <laughs> instead. Um, uh, let's see, I did read two books. I read uh, the biography of Andrew Jackson, which I didn't like okay. that much, yeah. but I went through it. Um, and then I read a book about the home run in 1951 that Bobby Thompson hit against the Brooklyn Dodgers. And the reason I'll never forget that is I was 13 years old. It was right after my bar mitzvah. And it was during the Aseret Yimei vote. And I think it's what turned me into an, into an agnostic. I mean, okay. if God could take the pennant away from the Brooklyn Dodgers, we were 13 and a half games ahead in August, and Bobby Thompson hits that darn home run on the last day of the season, it made me into a real doubter. But the book is really an uh, interesting one. It shows that the Giants cheated and had uh, a very high-tech system of stealing the signs that the catchers gave the pitchers. So Bobby Thompson knew he was getting a fastball from Ralph Frank. Now, nothing I said will be understandable to anybody in your audience who's under 60. Uh, but if you're over 60, you'll get what I mean. 
Well, my dad was both a Harvard Law man and a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. So I've heard these stories over and over and over That's again. That's what so my I wife appreciate. says, over and <laughs> over and over again. We have a way so, so what one kitchen or household staple did you and Mrs. Dershowitz stockpile um, uh, before the crisis? And toilet paper doesn't count. So what's no, that no, one we, item that you can't live without? Uh, chocolate. Uh, so okay. without it, uh, and and my wife rations it. So there is chocolate in the house. I do not know where it is. I can find the afikoman, but I cannot find my wife's chocolate. And every night after dinner, she discreetly comes out with either a mint, or a chocolate covered orange peel, or a chocolate covered decaffeinated espresso bean. And I get my allotment. And then I beg for more and I never get it because my wife wants to keep me in decent shape. Uh, that's the real secret to every marriage. So um, what's the most surprising check and call that you received from someone that we might know, an influencer, a famous person, a politician, who surprised you most by calling to check in on you and Mrs. Dershowitz? Well, you know, there haven't been that many surprises. Um, I've checked in on a lot of people. They checked back on me. Um, the one person that didn't call to check in on me is my stockbroker. I think he's embarrassed. Mine's uh, <laughs> not returning uh, my calls either. So, so but, I, I but think you're not alone in that. <laughs> everybody uh, has called. People I hardly know have said, you're important, stay safe, as if everybody else isn't important. Everybody's important. You know, this is a great equalizer, and there's no difference between how important you are. Uh, for me, uh, the most important call I've gotten recently is the call that told me that my dear friend Eli Beer, who is yes. the head of Hatzalah in Israel, is doing yeah. much better than he was doing. What happened yeah. is he went to Purim services in Miami Beach. In fact, I was mm -hmm. supposed to speak for Hatzalah right after he was there. And he was with a rabbi and the rabbi and he both came down with coronavirus. The rabbi left the hospital very quickly, but but. Um, uh, Ellie was very sick, but he's no longer on the ventilator and uh, he's doing better. He's still very sick, but he's doing better. And for me, I've been following that so closely because he is one of the great, great people in the world. If there are really Lama Dvavniks, uh, 36 people in every generation who do so many wonders for the world, it's Ellie Beer who founded Hatsala. Hatsala is still operating. Um, when my daughter and her fiance were coming to Israel, they were going to be surprised because I dedicated two uh, Ambu bikes to them yeah. and they have yeah. their names yeah. each on a bike. Yeah. And the nicest thing is when the bike or the Ambu cycle, my wife and I have an Ambu cycle with our names on it. When we, somebody is saved by our Ambu cycle or Ambu bike, we get an email and yeah. it just, just makes you so happy that what you contributed Help save a human life. As the Talmud says, you save a human life as if you've saved the whole world. Yes, we all know and love Ellie, and we're so grateful to get that news, especially um, right before the holidays. So, so MJ, MJ, we have two more questions for you. Okay, yeah, do it. Okay, two, more yeah, two more questions. Yeah, two more questions. Okay, it, so, uh, so this, this is a multiple choice question. Um, personally, this is my favorite time of the day, and I think the best television ever, but um, a, Trump is doing a very good job at the COVID press conferences, or B, Trump is doing a very bad job at the COVID press conferences. I mean, let's I don't like to get, next question. I don't like next to, question. Next, I, next question. I wrote a piece saying, let's not get politics involved in the fight against the pandemic. So I'm not going to comment on that. There you go. There you go. Next All question. Right. So the last, last question is then, how many books have you written since you started self-isolating? Um, well, I just about finished one and I'm starting to think about my next one. Um, I'm on number 45. My goal is 50. Uh, we'll see if I make 50. And of course, quality is more important than quantity. So I'm trying very hard to write, write, uh, write decent books. Uh, one essay I want to write, uh, interestingly enough, is about the argument I made in the Supreme Court based on Talmudic principles of, as I mentioned before, Pshat, Drash, So, Remez, Part, Pardes, and how influential my Talmudic training has been in the way I argue logically 
about legal issues. When I made my speech on the floor of the Senate, a number of rabbis called and said, it was obvious what you were doing. You were engaged in Talmudic interpretation, how you interpret a phrase in that appears in the Constitution or that appears in the Mishnah or that appears in the Torah. And um, I was pleased that that was recognized. Well, thank you so much, Professor Dershowitz. Danny, I'll pass it back off to you. Well, MJ, as always, you're, you did a great job. Thanks so much. And I, I love the questions and all that. And by the way, you notice that Al and I both anticipated the same answer. We don't want to get uh, involved in the politics. Although, Alan, I can ask you a question. Uh, how many pounds have you lost since you're back in Martha's Vineyard? I know you have uh, a problem there, do you not, uh, with your uh, liberal friends? Uh, how does that go? Well, I, I call it the Trump diet because nobody invites me to dinner anymore. Um, but of course, even if I had friends on the vineyard, we'd have to be isolated. We did include one couple and their daughter in our Zoom Seder. Um, but I have lost seven pounds since I started isolating here because, um, you know, we have limited access to, to food, particularly, although my wife and daughter made the most wonderful coffee cake out of cardamom uh, before Pesach. Um, I've been mostly staying away from sweets and so I'm down about seven pounds. Great. Well, we hope we stop there. So now let me go to some of our questions here. Uh, Yishai Friedman uh, asked, how will the corona reshape Israel's relationship with the Arab and European world? Well, one would hope that corona would help shape relationships all over the world. It really shows we are one world and these uh, borders that separate us. Um, so far already, the coronavirus has resulted in Yemen uh, having a ceasefire uh, and the number of attacks on Israel has gone down. Um, the rate of some crimes have gone up, the rate of other crimes have gone down. I would hope that the world would learn an interesting lesson that we're in it together. And there are issues that transcend petty, not so petty sometimes fights among us and maybe it will improve. Also, Israel has been, as usual, a light unto the nations in terms of its provision of medical expertise. I noticed that even Turkey was cooperating with Israel in uh, the exchange of um, medical supplies. So, um, you know, I'm an optimist and I hope maybe something good can come of this. Well, that's actually a very interesting answer in two ways. Number one, you actually answered the next question already prophetically, although uh, we don't we want to talk about prophecy. As Iris Goldman said, how do we keep from dividing further? How do we unite? Is COVID-19 uniting us once out of the crisis? What is the best approach? And this is uh, kind of a follow-up to what you just said. What is the best right. approach for recovery, both emotionally and economically? Well, I think, first of all, what we have to do is not scapegoat. That's the first thing we have to do. In Israel, that means do not scapegoat the Haredi community. In the United States, it means do not scapegoat the Chinese-American community. Um, do not stereotype. Do not generalize. There are disagreements and differences within all these communities. And um, uh, so I think that's the most important thing. How we get out of the economic crisis. Our countries have strong economies. Uh, this is a setback, but it's uh, 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 an external, it's a deus ex machina, it's from outside. It's not that the economy has its own internal problems. So I think the possibility, the capacity to come back is an important one, but it can't come back on a schedule. It can't accommodate elections or political goals. It has to come back on its own with the help of the right people, the Fed, the Bank of Israel, all of that. But look, we're smart people and we know how to run economies. Israel and the United States are two of the best economies in the world. And I'm confident that they will recover once we recover from this uh, terrible plague. Well, again, with that, Alan, thank you. I think it's, it's we've, we've run exactly a half hour over. Uh, but again, with you, uh, I know you've never been late. You were never late for a class in 50 years at Harvard. But uh, I know having been with you at many lectures, uh, the people are continuously asked me to stay a little bit over uh, and uh, stay with us a little longer. So I, I thank you for that. I also would like you to explain a little bit about your book, which you have now very graciously um, a, made available because of the, the crisis. Uh, mm -hmm. Free of charge, I understand. Anybody who wants to can download your latest book. Would you like to talk about that, please? 
Oh, sure. Look, uh, I was falsely accused by a woman and her lawyers for money um, of having had a sexual contact with her. I never met her. I never heard of her. Um, we have emails that now demonstrate she never heard of me. She never met me. She made the whole thing up. She made the whole thing up for money. Um, she has falsely accused many, many people. Her lawyer on tape says she's wrong, simply wrong. I wrote a book about it. I wrote a book because I support the Me Too movement, but I want to make sure it's not abused by money hungry people who want to exploit a good movement for their own financial benefits. So I wrote this book called Guilt by Accusation, The Challenge of Proving Innocence in the Age of Me Too. And I want to make it available as widely as possible so people can see both sides of the Me Too movement. And um, because people are shut in, I persuaded my publisher to make it available free. I've waived all royalties or anything like that because I just want people to read it and to learn from it. So if you want to just download, just go to Kindle and press the button. It's yours for free. It's 150 pages. It's a short read. So I appreciate if people would read it. And if people want to write to me about it or go on Twitter about it, that would be great as well. And again, the name of the book is Guilt by Accusation. Yeah, Guilt by Accusation, colon, the, the challenge of proving innocence in the age of hashtag me too. Right, but just if you go on guilt by accusation on uh, on Amazon, you'll find it. Because again, like many of the things which it does, and without getting too rabbinic about, you know, why not bearing false witness, you know, uh, is such an important mitzvah. Uh, not so much because it hurts the person. Of course, you were personally uh, injured by this, as was your family by the false accusations. But it really, the more uh, I say insidious or the more dangerous. Uh, dangerous effect of this is that it makes the next person who really does have a That's real right. uh, claim, their claims and their uh, their situation is then then ignored uh, because of the false accusation. Yeah, no, this 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 woman and her lawyers have done more to hurt the Me Too movement than uh, anybody else. Um, you know, when the Me Too movement properly accuses people, I'm on their side. But when you have a demonstrably false accusation, the former head of the FBI did a thorough investigation, came to the conclusion that she just made up the whole story. That you know, I never met her, never heard of her. Just she did it out of whole thought. And I have her own emails admitting it, basically, that she never met me, never heard of me. So um, it's important. It's an important read. It's uh, it's happening all over the world. So it has just as much application in Israel as it does in the United States. And I just want to make sure people who are at home and have something that they can read, something that benefits all of us. So it's a win-win. If you read it, I benefit. And if you read it, hopefully you benefit. And I don't think I'll have my next book finished in time. I hope when I finish my next book, this coronavirus is all over. But if it's not, I'll make that one available for you too. Okay. So of course, for our Orthodox listeners too, I'll ask you the one question, which you may not know. The, what day of the Omer is it, Alan? Uh huh. I, I could figure it out on my fingers, yeah, okay. but uh, it, okay. it's whatever go. the day is. I won't, I won't hold you to that. Okay, it's so fourth. it's fourth, probably fourth. So let me, four, right? Yeah. Let me let me do this, however. But um, a, I do want to uh, first of all apologize to those people who, who sent in questions that we didn't have time for. Uh, when we do get some reactions from this, we'll see if we want to go ahead and perhaps do it again. If you'll be so gracious uh, to give us time uh, to do it some uh, in uh, in the future. And I wanted to thank you and uh, wish you a Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. And um, I do also want to hold your feet to the fire about coming back with your daughter and uh, her now. We will. Day. And uh, we'll all look forward to that. And if anybody there does have questions, uh, please send put them on the Facebook thing and they'll get them to me and I'll get them to Professor Dershowitz. And uh, hopefully, I uh, just want to wish everyone a Chag Sameach and uh, be safe. That's the most important yeah, thing. Be, be safe, safe out there. Take care. Bye, everybody. Thanks for Bye-bye. Bye.